Good afternoon, everyone. I'm calling to order the Health, Environment, and Community Engagement Committee. Uh, my name is Cam Gordon. I'm chair of the committee. Today, I'm joined by Council Members Cano, Glidden, Bender, and Fry. I believe that Council Member Andrew Johnson will be missing today. Um, the committee has three items to consider today. First will be a public hearing, uh, and the third will be a discussion item. So I think I'll take the consent item, which is number two first. Um, the public hearings on a, uh, ordinance amendment to our amplified sound equipment ordinance. Um, and the third one is about the consent decree between Northern Metals and the state of Minnesota and the city of Minneapolis. And my plan is to take some public comment um, after a presentation from staff on the discussion item. I believe there's also a motion before committee members they can look at. But first, we'll take up the uh, consent item, which is accepting additional grant funds from Public Health Institute to assess community impact of climate change. This is accepting $10,000 in grant funds to address public health and climate change in Minneapolis. Um, seeing no desire to discuss that from my colleagues then, all in favor of that, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. That motion carries then. And then we'll go to our uh, ordinance amendment, and I think we'll have a brief presentation before um, the public hearing. Good Welcome. Afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, council member, or uh, council chair, yeah. Yeah, members. Uh, my name is Jim Doughton. I'm the supervisor of environmental services in uh, the health department, and to give you a brief presentation on the amplified sound proposed amendments that are authored by. Councilmember Bender. Purpose why we're here today is to, uh, of course, establish what uh, is going to be happening. Went too far. Go back. There we go. To establish uh, limits on the time, duration, and loudness of the use of amplified sound and establish cr clear criteria what constitutes a violation and establish a fair basis for issuing permits and establish when a permit is required. Current ordinance, we have one type of permit, a little sensitive here. One type of permit, and permits required when amplified sound exceeds five decibels in the surrounding area over the ambient, and it can, cannot be more than 90 decibels, 50 feet in front of the source, or more than 15 decibels over the ambient in the surrounding neighborhoods. It's currently measured with the sound meter, which is used here, a fairly sophisticated piece of equipment, of which we have two. And uh, it also has no, a requirement to notify adjacent properties, but not other properties in the area. That's one of our staff measuring, measuring sound from the Buffalo. So, uh, but current situation is we have limited staff and equipment in order to enforce. We have four, four inspectors covering the entire city, quite a few permits that go out, particularly in the summertime. And we have one size permit that one size fits all, no matter what regard to the type of activity. We also have an unintended consequences of making it illegal some of the civic involvement activities that are going on with labor organizing, uh, union pro or union organizing, civic protests, things like that. And also it's inadequate notification. One of the big things that we've had over the years in our department is on these main complaint is they didn't know. And we have the requirement to notify the adjacent properties, but beyond that they don't. And so a lot of people in the impacted area call up the council members and who help call me, and that's one of the big complaints we're getting from the note, from the residents. And also, we have no requirement to uh, get this permit in advance of the th of the event. We could come on in immediately before the event and get it, get the permit, which doesn't allow time to prepare the permit, coordinate, uh, notify neighbors, notify police, and do all the other uh, qualifications that we need to do. What we're proposing to do is introduce a three-tier system that is based on risk, introduce what's called a plainly audible standard to allow increased enforcement, and have an exemption for small handheld devices such as bullhorns in order to uh, preclude the inadvertent uh, civic involvement, and increase the neighbor notification based on the type of activity.
First of all, this uh, the concept of plainly audible, which is sound that can be detected by a person using their unaided hearing or facilities, and it's meant to be something that's understandable, not just I notice it. Uh, this comes from a paper by Zwirling in 2012 on analysis of, of plainly audible. It's been adopted within New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Boston, and other cities as a way to use the, expand their enforcement. So it allows us, what we're hoping to, is allow business licensing and the police to be able to do on-spot enforcement is on these permits and magnify our ability to do enforcement, just get it away from the four inspectors we currently have. Or in addition. What the standards we're looking at is that if you can hear this within 100 feet of an event, and this is primarily geared towards the patio activities that we get a lot of complaints from downtown and in the uh, uptown area, but if you can hear, plainly hear the activity, the amplified sound at 100 feet, which is the third of a block, block we determined that that would clearly be in a, in a violation over five, the five decibel limit and a require a permit, but it'll really allow our business and license inspectors when they're out patrolling in the evenings to uh, enforce on patio noise. For a small event permit, and this is meant to be the things like the backyard parties and small, or the, the small sound systems, et cetera, which are low risk, we usually don't monitor. If you can hear it at 300 feet, which is a block, they'd be in violation. And for a standard or large block event permit, uh, plainly audible at 600 feet, which is about two blocks. And I was at the Stanley's uh, event yesterday, or it's on uh, Saturday, and, or was Sunday, but the, uh, we went out about two blocks out, couldn't hear it. So it was pretty effective in, in that thing. And it, it was a nice, nice concert at the event. Civic involvement, what we're proposing to do is uh, Handheld equipment, 10, mega, 10 watts or less, such as a bullhorn, will be categorically exempt from requiring an outdoor amplified sound permit between 7 and 10, as it is now. And this is for like a lot of activities that gone on at the federal courthouse or out in the neighbors, neighbors uh, to allow people to express themselves freely. And this is a standard that we found in San Francisco, and we're just adopt, or proposing to adopt what San Francisco standard is. We want to improve the neighborhood notification. The current standard is for all type of events is to notify the adjacent neighbors. Uh, some of these two houses down wouldn't get notified, which doesn't seem to you know, make sense. We're not requiring any change for the small event permits. It will remain the same. But for the standard permit, uh, what we're requiring is to notify within a 300 foot or one block radius. And for the large block event is in addition to that is to notify the neighborhood association to get wider distribution. And um, one thing I should say with the uh, small event is just to think about is we're, we're asking for a lower sound threshold so it, the sound won't carry as far. Then kind of miscellaneous here as well, we're proposing that the standard and small event permits not be issued uh, past 9 o'clock on Sunday in order to allow the, give the neighborhoods a rest. Uh, from noise activities before starting the standard work week. And then uh, in order to make sure that we get the permits in on time, we're proposing a 50% uh, penalty on the director's fee for not obtaining the permit more less than 36 hours in advance of the activity. Allows our staff the uh, chance to uh, vet the permit, process it, not do the notification in coordination with the precinct, et cetera. So in conclusion, these proposed amendments were trying to reduce the barrier for residents to do small activities and charge them half fee for small event in exchange for a lower amplified sound level, 80 decibels instead of 90, which is uh, half the volume. Enhanced compliance, active, or ability to comply through the conservative audible standards. And what we've done is calculate how sound decays away from the site in order to make sure that at two blocks it would be a violation. Uh, reduce the uh, resident complaints through improved notification. Uh, we've, our general feedback is, I wish I had known about it, I could have planned my life accordingly, or had a chance to say. And avoid inadvertent non-compliance and civic involvement activities through the 10-watt uh, limitation. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, does the council have any questions?
thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Fry, I believe, has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is maybe about four or five slides back. It's in regard to the, the distance, which yes, is acceptable where you can still hear sound. And I think it said 600 feet. And so it would be six, is my understanding correct, that it would be 600 feet would be allowable for large events, but not 601 feet? Oh. I thought I saw that. The, uh, the standard is, the, a standard block is 304 feet. And so that was kind of the basis of the interpretation. Yeah. And it's hard to measure with the tape measure to go on out and go to the, you know, the speaker and measure out 600 right. feet. So I, I'm, but the, the, just to be clear, the standard would be 600 it would be about, about two blocks. Is that what Correct. you're saying? Correct. Okay. And that was that was the intent. And we've we've done calculations on this where the sound this through the how the sound should attenuate as it goes away from the Yeah. House. Yeah, that's my question. Just with some of these significant block parties that we have downtown in the warehouse district over the summer, um, I'm sure my office gets complaints about them. That being said, a lot of people enjoy having them as well. Correct. Um, and I could be totally wrong on this, but I imagine that the sound travels at least two blocks. The, uh, it, it does, particularly through those canyons and corridors, right. it can project. We've had, I've had standards where at, at the caboose, they'll be playing there, I go across into the uh, Vill Ventura Village across there, and I can stand here and hear it, stand here and I can't. Sound yeah, is kind okay. of, it, it's odd, it depends how it reflects. You may right. pick it a pocket here, pocket there. And in those canyons, particularly in downtown, it will project. So are we going to be flexible on the projection, or are we going to have uh, abide by the stringent rule of the number of feet? Depends on the event. Th that was one of the other things we're looking at is uh, one of the things I should say is what intended to have on here is the fee, the, for the small event, we're having a half fee because it doesn't take much to process. We have minimal complaints and minimal right. monitoring requirements. Standard fee, we, standard event, we have 100% uh, of the fee schedule, which as it is, is it as is now. Mm -hmm. And for the large block events and such, like the Basilica block party, et cetera, we do have a double fee because of the, compl the complexity and the coordination and the increased enforcement we have. It's more and more likely to dispatch my inspectors to uh, the X Games or the Basilica party than I am to Aunt Mabel's backyard. And uh, so we're proposing a double fee on that 200% on the large block event. That would be the fee just to get the, the fee. Permit. Yeah, but the, get the what permit. About the, but the notification or the, uh, uh, the 600 feet, it really does depend on a lot on the, uh, uh, what effect it's having on the neighborhood. There right. does there is a common sense component that comes in to, into compliance yeah. in the affected area. It's a big difference if I get uh, noise into a primarily residential neighborhood as opposed to a commercial neighborhood. Yeah, so that's my that's and I agree with you and and but that's kind of my concern is that I you know if someone were to cite to the black letter law in this instance, then they could shut down most any concert that we have outside. Yeah, whether it, it's it, Boom it, Island or you know, on some surface parking lot downtown or in a neighborhood. And I totally get shutting down in the neighborhood. And I know Council Member, Member Bender dealt with a really frustrating incident last year when I totally agree with her. Yep. I'm just thinking of, of, of how this would impact, you know, Alabama Shakes performing at Boom Island, which you can hear all the way across the river. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. The, uh, that's, a good, that's a very good point. And the, I know exactly the event you're talking about. That drove a lot of our standards. Right. Um, what we're looking at, it, there is a degree of discretion. However, when you take a look at the law, how the law is working at, it, it, it depends on the individual, the inspector there. But the intent is not to shut them down. Can you, the intent is to turn down the volume. So it, when I'm looking at the actual ordinance language, it looks like our large block events are still going to be measured um, with the uh, um, decibels. Uh, so there's not, not necessarily the 600 feet at all, so I'm, there might be a little bit of confusion. Yeah, Can you just clarify? It, it is. What we're trying to do is give some flexibility to the business inspectors and, and police to if they see an, an unusual effect on the neighborhood to get, allow them the opportunity to step up and do enforcement. In this case, we're not trying to shut them down. What we're trying to do is turn it down. And uh, we, we do have the standard is still going to be measured at 90, 90 decibels at 50 feet with this and no more than 15 decibels over the ambient and surrounding neighborhood. And you'll find out that, this is, I agree with you on a lot of them, 
you'll see areas like in downtown where we'll project down to 900 feet. Right. You'll be able to hear it because of the canyon effect. Um, but the standard is, is that this is still the standard here. If we've got inspectors out there, they're going to be the primary enforcer. But okay. the main intent is that we ha we got four inspectors right now and uh, going on out, but they tend to have business licensing and police everywhere. And business, we've worked with business licensing and the police and the development of these standards. And so uh, uh, business license has quite e been quite eager to see the adoption of it. So, they so can, the standard hasn't really changed for large events is what you're no, saying? No, no. What I did is basically calculate that out to be that the, at this distance, it's a, it's if we, we hear it at this distance, it should be a violation. The, the, the sound should have attenuated well before that point. And that's one of the things I field checked this weekend going out to one of the events. Um, but there is, a, there is discretion in there, but the standard is still, this is the gold standard, the sound meter with our people, and it's, the tendency is that the larger events the, that we have higher risk, we're going to have people out there doing the monitoring, but we can't be everywhere every time. And so we're trying to put a standard in that allows business licensing and police to, to ask them to turn it down if necessary to minimize the impact on residents. And the way I read the ordinance, the, um, it's the um, small... Um, events um, that will be the 300 feet and that's where there's a lot of flexibility so that others can come and walk a distance away and figure out what it is and if we're going to be intervening in a large event we're still going to go back to measuring the decibels um, and using that is that correct correct sir thank you is that does that help council member Fry? i think so okay. um, i don't see any other questions so i think what i will we'll do now is open up the uh public hearing and see if anybody's come to speak on this issue thank you very much thank you sir. so now the public hearing is opened if you want if you're here to uh, speak on the amplified sound ordinance amendment anybody here to speak on that matter I'm assuming no one has signed in uh, I'm seeing nobody come forward then I'm going to close the public hearing on that and maybe I'll turn to council member uh, Bender would you like to make a motion or speak on this thank you mr. chair uh, I'll move the item um, I, I do want to note, you know, if there's anything between now and council when we vote, yeah. um, then, then, you know, maybe um, staff can sit down with Council Member Fry or any other council members that may want a more detailed briefing on some of those technical aspects of where the decibels are measured and how far away and all that stuff. Um, we did have a, so I have a huge number of events in my ward, which we support and welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and for the most part, People, you know, some people feel a little inconvenienced, but otherwise I think people just kind of accept it as part of our summer season of all the businesses in Uptown that have individual events and then some of the bigger events as well. Um, and really the intention of this was just to give more clarification to our staff and more flexibility in who can help enforce the regulations. Um, and then I think it was actually in Councilmember Johnson's uh, ward, but it probably happens besides just that one instance where there was a a really small gathering and we only have this one system for getting a, a, a permit um, so that was becoming a barrier again as staff mentioned yeah. to people who wanted to do these smaller gatherings that I also think we want to support in the city um, again we have a pretty short warm season so folks getting out and having block parties or gatherings in their own home um, we don't want to sort of over over regulate that uh, so I think that this approach again was really um, staff driven but um, so if council members have any other questions or comments before council I think they're welcomed, but that was sort of the underlying intent and origin of this. So thanks, Mr. Chair. So Councilman Fry, I'd be more than happy to meet with you or your staff to discuss the, the technical aspects or, or concerns that you have on. Can you just point me to, uh, maybe I'm not seeing it, in the ordinance where it designates 600 feet as the standard for larger events? It's not in here. Okay. Is it in a, it's in a, is it a different part of the code? So if you look at if you look at section Okay, so it says so at number seven, it says amplified sound plainly audible police, business licensing, or health department personnel or their designees at 300 feet from the property line shall be, shall be considered a violation of the small event permit which makes sense, I think, um, so one block away. Um, what's the standard for the large? No, you're, you're right here. Um, we had it in there. I don't know why this version does not have it in here. So I'll have to reapply, reapply here. 
The um, what I have here right now is you are correct. We have the 50 at 50 feet to you need a basically need a permit. At 100 feet, you're in violation. But the at the uh, uh, 300 feet for the small event. But you're right. I do not see the 600 feet. But that was the intent. Well, the only thing that I could find was number three that references the standard for large block events, and that's yeah, that is correct. You are correct. Is the current standard right now is still uh, as it is written right now would be this would be the gold standard for the standard for the large block event. We don't have the 600 feet in this language here. But this is the language before us, and I believe that's the language that Council Member Bender has moved. Are there any uh, amendments or anything? So I, I mean, I, if, if I, I would like to vote in favor of this, I just think we should have a criteria for the larger events if we've got something for the smaller events, and I'd, I'm not ready to just make an amendment on the spot. Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of. Wondering how you want to handle this, but I can't miss. Well, I thought that the criteria was that sound measured at 50 feet from the source shall not exceed 90 decibels for standard and large block event permits. And once they exceeded those, they'd be asked to turn. No, that is that is correct. But the intent was, like you said, with this version that came through here, I'm not sure how, but we had the 600 feet in there prior for the large and standard events to allow the the basically to allow the business license and police to enforce on that. Oh. So they can understand if they can understand it at two blocks. We, they can ask them to turn it down. It didn't. It was, but it did not make it the final version. And I'm this. I'm embarrassed. No, it's well, obvious. that's so, okay. Worry, that's fine. something that we can certainly um, fix between now and the council meeting, or we could lay it over here in committee if we'd like. We could move it forward without recommendation. We could also move it forward as as it was moved with recommendation. Um, maybe I'll defer to the author. Do you have any suggestion for how you'd like to do this? Right, so I, I think we could, I think any of those is fine. At this point, we could move it forward with that recommendation and then just take the time before council to um, get that final language yeah. and make sure it's the right distance. I think that's just fine. Yeah, that's that's smart. Okay. All right. So, so I'll withdraw my previous motion and move to forward with that recommendation. Okay. Thank you very much. And then much. if we need more time, we can always refer it back to committee before council. Fantastic. I th I think, and I think this will be fairly easy to correct, so. Sure. So I'll, I'll get that some draft language now to you again to uh, amend that. No problem. All right. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Well, then we have a motion before us to move this forward without recommendation. Seeing no discussion on that, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. That motion carries then. So now we can move on to our third item um, before us. And uh, on the uh, uh, agenda, it says that we are going to. Uh, the, Consider accepting the $600,000 over three years from the consent decree with Northern Metals. Also pass a resolution appropriating the funds to the health department. I just want to let um, my colleagues up here know and others in the room that there's also another um, resolution that will be moved forward and there's copies of it over there, um, which has to do with the staff direction to staff and also a request to the state legislature, if I could call it a request. Um, and also I intend after the presentation to, I think, take about 10 or 20 minutes of public comment. Maybe I'll ask people if they're here and they're hoping to speak on this. Could you just raise your hand so I have an idea of how many people that is? Is anybody here hoping to speak on this matter? Okay, I think 10 minutes looks like it'll be fine then because. There's a couple. It does not apply to the top. Okay. So this. All right. Well, if we need to take more, we can take more too. And now, Mr. Huff, would you like to. Uh, Give us a presentation. Let us know. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Members. My name is Daniel Huff. I'm the Director of Environmental Health with the City's Health Department. Um, some background. Uh, at, the, at your last Council meeting of the year, last year, um, you authorized the City's Attorney's Office to uh, participate and intervene as necessary in two cases that were moving forward, uh, one in Ramsey uh, County Court uh, district court and uh, one which was a contested case hearing uh, before an administrative law judge. Um, in uh, uh, as a result of that, um, the city became an intervener in uh, the lawsuit between the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and Northern Metals LLC. As a result, a consent decree was um, signed by uh, the city 
uh, the PCA and Northern Metals LLC and accepted by uh, the district court in March of this year. In that consent decree, there is a $2.57 million settlement that Northern Metals has agreed to pay. $1 million of that is a civil penalty, goes to the Pollution Control Agency. However, um, it is uh, actually, it goes to the state general fund, uh, and then it would be the discretion of the governor and legislature in appropriating that. Uh, $460,000 uh, goes to cover past and future monitoring costs uh, by the Pollution Control Agency. Another $510,000 goes to pay the court and attorney fees to the Pollution Control Agency. And finally, $600,000 of that comes to the city of Minneapolis for health mitigation. And that's what we are uh, uh, talking about today is really that last portion, the $600,000. Um, in order to, um, uh, even though this is it was a, a lawsuit, and often in lawsuits, uh, things are worked out behind closed door. The Pollution Control Agency did want to uh, hear from the community, and they uh, asked if we would assist them in setting up some meetings to really listen to what the community is interested in seeing for uh, the $600,000 that would be part of the health mitigation. So we held two meetings in January. Had really good participation. Um, the uh, numbers here are just those that signed in, and it's not counting city staff or PCA staff, even if they happen to live in the neighborhood. Um, we recorded all those comments, and those are summarized in your council agenda today, both uh, um, the raw comments and then um, kind of categorized and summarized comments. We then met with uh, uh, your colleagues in their offices, as well as Mayor Hodge's office, and then we met with um, some members of the legislative delegation, went through those comments, went through what people heard at the, at the meetings. And um, from there, we uh, developed guiding principles, um, uh, which I have here. One is, let's make sure that whatever we spend it on mitigates health issues that would be associated with the pollution, pollutants of concern in that area, primarily with particles and metals. Uh, we want to make sure we have good cost benefit. We want to get a good bang for a buck. $600,000 doesn't necessarily go that far over three years. How do we make the best use of that? Um, utilize things that we have already developed. Don't reinvent a wheel. And then it needs to, to benefit uh, residents who uh, have been impacted and are close to uh, the shredder operations for Northern Metals. From those discussions then, we came up with the health mitigation strategies that are outlined in the consent decree. Uh, and if you're interested, those are in the, uh, at the top of the RCA there, the, the staff letter, um, and I have just summarized them, them here. The consent decree, that's what we have to do as a city, uh, because that is the court accepted consent decree. There's obviously some flexibility within that, uh, but unless we were to go back and change the consent decree, that is what uh, we have committed to as a recipient of these funds. Um, we, uh, we also are looking at some additional, we heard additional concerns from the community. One was, let's have more monitoring. Um, we want to know what else is happening in air quality there. And so we have committed, as is the PCA, in looking at that area, how do we take our existing resources, our existing work plans, and make sure that we have a, a good, robust monitoring program there? Um, another is land use, and uh, our zoning administrator has agreed that uh, we'll take a look at how is land use uh, um, regulated and zoned in that area. And then also looking at safe drinking water, we're looking at using another grant and some additional just staff resources, specifically with uh, asking our schools uh, how we can be of assistance for them. And um, our next steps here, uh, we've, we've heard from the community, they definitely want to be involved, continually involved in this process. So we're beginning to reach out, developing a, an advisory committee. First thing we need to do is develop what the charge of that advisory committee is. We, uh, we have some parameters. We obviously have, are limited by the amount of money that's here. We're limited by, uh, we have to con comply with what is in the consent decree. Um, and then obviously we have our own city processes and 
uh, requirements that we will follow. Um, but we want to make sure that we uh, work with the community uh, as we go forward with this. And uh, we'll begin the program implementation. Uh, and uh, as outlined in the consent decree, we're going to report back to the Pollution Control Agency annually on uh, how we use the money and what we accomplish. Um, I, uh, I wanted to make sure that my contact information was part of the um, presentation here so that if people have concerns, if they have questions or comments, they can reach out to me directly uh, via email or phone. Uh, we can have a chat and um, uh, happy to always go out in the community and meet with folks. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a question in general about the decree. Yes. Um, and I was disappointed to see that the shredder can stay in operation until August of 2019. Um, wasn't there some hope that they would have to move sooner? And um, why did the judge end up giving them all the way till 2019 to move? Um, uh, Chair Gordon, <clears throat> I can only answer with the information that I have. Um, the Pollution Control Agency staff and their attorneys negotiated the settlement. Our portion that we worked on and provided to the Pollution Control Agency is what's in the uh, on page 14F, City of Minneapolis mitigation. Um, the, uh, um, I would defer to the Pollution Control Agency, and unfortunately they uh, had a conflict of being here today, but I've always been willing to, to discuss their perspective, so I don't want to answer for them. Um, but I know that that has been of concern of many in the community. Uh, I do know that it takes a long time to move an operation, to get permitting in a new location. Uh, and from what I understand, Northern Metals is looking at a, a site in Becker, Minnesota, uh, and that the PCA is committed to working with the company to have that as expedited as possible. Um, and I think that it's the that's the last possible date that they have to operate. Um, and the hope, I think, is that they would move even sooner than that. Well, and I did read some, some, clearly there's the possibility they could they could move sooner. If they don't have everything submitted on time, they could be in trouble as early as this summer. But if they have everything that's streamlined, they could maybe move sooner. But I just, That is correct. And so they could go until August of 2019. I also just want to point out that that's only about the shredder operations. Right. Northern Metals may continue to operate as a transfer site or do other activities um, um, that are not under the PCA program. Appreciate that. Um, I see a couple other questions. I'm not sure who came to that up first. Uh, Councilmember Kano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, could you describe if there's any um, legal, um, if, if the court ordered any specific ways that this money needs to be used by the city? Because I know I've been getting a lot of questions from residents about um, how will the $600,000 be used specifically? Is the money going to pay for city staff to do work? Is it going to go out into community groups that are working on some of these um, issues or related issues? Or, or can you, you know, just kind of go into detail about, you know, what is the process for using the funds? What will it go towards? And um, are, are we legally mandated to do it that way? Or is there some um, um, flexibility? Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Cano, um, the we are bound to do exactly what it says in the uh, consent decree, which gives us a lot of flexibility. I like to look at this as these are the outcomes. Our tactics are flexible. Um, we have obvious the parameters of this is how much money there is. We have the parameters of here's the city process of how we do things. Um, but there is flexibility. That's what I we hope to engage with the community advisory group. Um, we in the health department have looked at how we're proposing to plan to spend this um and that is also in one of the attachments um you'll see uh it's, it's in in your packet sort of a summary of what what we are proposing we have a breakdown where we'd use thirty thousand dollars to enhance some of our our lead uh testing activities and we say a hundred and seventy thousand dollars on the asthma programming that is flexible there's nothing in the consent decree that says we have to split it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of these are things that we um, will be discussing with the advisory committee. Um, but I, we do always want to go back to the principles that um, uh, I heard from, from your colleagues um, 
as uh, as how we look at this. Um, and those these are the guiding principles of how we want to be um, using these funds going forward. Thank you. Council Member Fry, did you have a question? No, I'm Mr. Chair, I'm fine. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions then. Thank you very much. And maybe there'll be some more okay. that come up. And now I would like to open the uh, floor to community comments. It seemed like there were maybe three people who wanted to comment. Just keep your comments to three minutes and um, I, it would be appreciated. And, and just begin by stating your name and address so the clerk has it in the record. Good afternoon. Chairperson uh, Gordon and honorable council members, my name is Nancy Prismas and I represent the Botno Neighborhood Association as their staff person. Our board were all working today and could not come, um, but they empowered me to speak to you on their behalf. I have three points to make that are very important. One, the Lowry Avenue 909 PCA site, which is what was monitoring uh, Northern Metals Recycling and the GAF Building Materials Corporation, which are both level five polluters, the worst polluters that the EPA has. We're going to pull that permit or that uh, um, air monitoring station December 31st, 2014. And we begged and pleaded with the MPCA to keep that site open until the end of the year and to please start monitoring once every six days for 24 hours. Within six weeks, they caught Northern Metals violating their permit. And the rest is history. They moved to close them. They were sued by MPC, uh, MPCA was sued by Northern Metals. Um, finally, in 2016, they started to prevail. Uh, at the 11th hour, the city joined the suit so you could get some money to help remediate things. But none of this money would be here if citizens from both sides of the river who are represented here today had not been advocating for public health all that time, this $600,000 would not be here. It's our money. It's our money. The health department didn't write a grant for it. It's our money. And we deserve not to have a say after you approve some parameters we deserve to say that this money should be spent to show what caused lead poisoning at such a high rate in the community, what is causing asthma at 844% higher rate of our deaths in Hawthorne and Botno and Marshall Terrace and McKinley, those four census tracts. What is causing such a um, level of uh, asthma hospitalizations at the highest rate. We believe it's air pollution, but no causal study has ever been done. No correlation study has been done. That means we can't hold Northern Metals accountable if we don't do some studies. We need the health department to do that. They have statisticians. They have lots of people who are researchers who can help us. Because if you look at what it costs for one cancer caused by them. It's about $2 million in hospitalization. If 50, if 50 people, we can show if 50 people were caused by health by this, that's $100 million that they should be paying. <clears throat> Northern Metals is not just this corporation here on the river. They have hundreds of plants all over the country. They have hundreds of plants more all over the world. They are exchanged on the British Stock Exchange, but they aren't a British company. They are headquartered in the Caymans. And this company has blood money. This is blood money, because they don't care how many people get asthma. They don't care how many people get lead poisoning. And there are children whose parents never smoked, and they don't have lead problems in their house and they're babies who are still nursing, and they've come down with lead poisoning. Well, where did it come from? It comes from the air when their mommies run them in the strollers down the street catching the bus. We want studies to prove that they should be held accountable, and not just Northern Metals, but also GAF. And the city did not get that extended air pollution uh, monitoring 
It was the citizens this October that was awarded the CAMP, the community monitoring program that the MPCA put on, first over at Phillips, and then up at Owens Corning, and now on the river. We did that. We, the citizens, not the city health department. We need you to direct them. And I, I think they're good people and they're hardworking people, but we need you to direct them to help us because never in the history of changing environmental problems has anything ever been done unless public health studies shored up what the community already knew. When Judge Miles Lord overturned reserve mining in the 70s to stop the asbestos from going into the Lake Superior, which was poisoning all the people and giving them mesothemioma in Duluth and in Silver Bay, it was because the health departments, the health departments got together and proved it. And then it went to court. We can't do this without you. We've hit, we're, we, we, just, we just bunted and we luckily got to first base. Please, I entreat each and every one of you to seriously think about how this, this gift of $600,000 got given to us and how it should be spent because hundreds of millions of dollars of remediation and there's a cap on that site of 12 inches of concrete because it's so polluted, the soil so polluted. When they expanded it in 2009, they had to cap it. There's soil pollution, water pollution, air pollution, lead pollution. Please reconsider. That's not that the health department doesn't deserve all the money for the current suggestions they've made. They do. But we need it in a different way. We need to prove what they have done. And we need your help. We can't do it without you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who'd like to address the committee? Welcome. Hi, my name is Roxanne O'Brien, and um, I wouldn't say my address because I feel like working on environmental justice issues is kind of dangerous. Um, but I'm here today with quite a few residents who are frustrated, we're all frustrated by the whole entire process. Um, it's been about five years since I started paying attention and being involved in this issue. And when I started paying attention, I started notice, noticing like corruption involved in this issue, being that there were judges um, involved that were working for Northern Metals in a way and not for the people. And then now, um, now that the settlement money is in question or now that this the lawsuit started and it was settled, there were concerns that I had about how every time a lawsuit occurs, there's like this backroom deal where they the company gets a chance to um, secretly discuss what they are going to do regardless of how the residents feel. So in way, one way, I felt like the money was kind of stuffed down our throats um, it was like, what do you guys want to do with the money, you know, before it even got here? Um, and quite a few of us said, we just want um, this company to shut down. It's been very irresponsible. Um, matter of fact, it, the reason why the lawsuit started was because they were trying to shut down pollution monitors. They were trying to sue the MPCA for, for even monitoring and protecting us. So that concerns me that we're still allowing a company that clearly is wrong to keep working in our community, making millions of dollars. It, it makes me feel like that there are no public officials who are actually protecting us like they should be. Another thing I'm concerned about is I keep hearing that they were already going to move by this date. So then what was the point? And if we are forced to take this money, then why isn't it coming to us? I'm also concerned with um, Dan Huff being in control 
solely by himself to pick and choose who's going to be on a community committee. I think, I mean, I don't know if you're from my neighborhood, but I think that, I think that that's inappropriate. I think that people who are actually really affected by this should have more power, more power and more say in what's getting done. I'm concerned that we're using some of the money to work on lead issues when the whole conversation was that Northern Metals really wasn't responsible for the lead issues, that it was a housing paint issue. So then why are we putting money into that? I mean, I'm all for getting, you know, children and families, whatever they need to be healthy and, and supporting them. I'm just concerned that this money is going to disappear in the pockets of people who continuously are unaccountable in our communities. Um, let me see one other thing. So my request is, is that whoever decides to make a community council or a community committee that would oversee these funds, I would hope it would be more than just one person. I would hope that it, um, the city council actually make this group. Um, I don't think he has a lot of good relationships with people in our community. Uh, matter of fact, I've been like, I've not even been told about half of the meetings. A lot of the meetings are happening um, at an organization that I don't trust at all and who haven't had anything to do with the work up until money started being discussed. So that just shows me right there that he's, he's not going to make a good decision about who gets to sit on this committee. So I'm just hoping you guys are paying attention and watching because it, it, everything just seems funny right now. That's it. Thank you very much. I believe there was at least one more person who wanted to speak. Well, maybe I was wrong. Yes, come forward. We're asking for a name and address for the record. Oh, great. Um, hello, council members. My name is Shalini Gupta. I'm with the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy. We're an environmental justice research and policy center that's located at 4511 South 34th Avenue in Minneapolis. We are a national environmental justice organization, but we are based here in Minneapolis. Um, I just want to say that Northern Metals is a great win for environmental justice. Um, in that fashion, it needs to be a great win for community residents in terms of process as well as in terms of content. So there's no doubt that the $600,000 will be going to good use for the residents, but our concern is that in order to adhere by the principles of environmental justice, there needs to be a strong commitment to resident-led voices in the decision-making process and how those monies are spent. That means that um, community residents that have been organizing against Northern Metals should be deciding who sits on some sort of review panel. Um, I think there's a lot of great models that this can be fashioned after. The health department itself has a green business to review committee where there are um, a cross sector of, um, uh, of community groups as well as other um, uh, resident based organizations that will participate in decision making processes. There's a lot more that can be done, but there is that there. Um, Headwaters Foundation for Justice has a community's grant-led making process, and I'm sure there's other models out there that can be fashioned where residents are really in charge of um, determining where these monies are spent. There's a lot of good projects that this could go to, no doubt. North Minneapolis, it was targeted as a green zone, thanks to the great work you all did on April 28th to designate it as such. Um, but in that sense, it, it has to have a strong process component that is accountable to community residents. And that, what, that is what we're hoping for that really comes out of this as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one more speaker, I believe. Want to come forward? Yeah. Good. 
good to have you here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Louis Solomayu. I live at 2000 Seabury Avenue in Minneapolis. And uh, I'm speaking for the North American Water Office right now. There are two issues that I wanted to address. One is related to democracy and the other to education. Um, over the past uh, three years, I've been doing a lot of work during the winter months in Africa, focused on food security and uh, environmental justice. And one of the things that I noticed when I was in Sierra Leone, West Africa, I was uh, living and working in a region called Kinema, uh, living in a village called Mandema. And we were trying to get them to set aside land to create permacultural farms and early childhood centers working together. And one of the things that one of the chiefs told me was that they couldn't do anything until they had the approval of their village. And it just struck me, oh, this is an example of democracy that I haven't really seen. And I think I'm really concerned that we're listening to the voices of the community before we make really big decisions that affect the health and wellness of generations yet to be born. The other thing that strikes me is that uh, our public school system needs to like really shift gears at this time so that they're making decisions based upon 21st century realities. And to me, that means that the science and sociology need to prepare children to work in a world where uh, they're really plugged into their necessity, necessity and reality of creating a green economy. We're resolving our environmental problems through the work that we create locally. So that's about it. I think that's pretty much to the point. And if I feel like if those things aren't happening, listening to the people and educating the children to really create the kind of culture and society that we need in the 20th century to survive. We're at a real turning point as a species. And unless we make some difficult decisions and deal with the challenges of really having a different culture, we're going to be in deeper trouble than we are now. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak at this time? Well, we, I'm, I'm sure we could give you a minute or two if you'd like. We don't have a we don't have any rules about where you have to be from. Sometimes when we are talking about our city budget, we have people who happen to come elsewhere, own property here or something. So just keep your comments to two or three minutes. That would be appreciated. I'm Leah Fouché. I'm also with the North American Water Office. I'm the Environmental Justice Director there. I'm also um, on the Pollution Control Agency Commissioner's Environmental Justice Advisory Group. And I was honored to speak at the National Environmental Justice Council uh, last month, where I heard our honored mayor, uh, Betsy Hodges, give an exemplary speech on community and environmental justice. She literally glittered in her brilliance. And so I ask you, how can you take environmental justice and community and throw it under the bus when you have that example that you presented to the world and the nation? You can't. It's not justice to throw this money outside of the community purview. The community has to tell you, advise you, and give you direction and guidance. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Seeing nobody else interested in speaking then, uh, committee members, um, I know that we have a, a resolution before us to look at too, but I wonder if there's comments or questions. Council Member Fry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
the Northern Metals uh, has been in existence for somewhere in the range of about a hundred years, and these decisions that that have been made uh, in North Minneapolis over that hundred-year period, I think, have have caused this cross section of both uh, poverty and pollution that we now experience today. Whether it was intentional redlining, uh, intentional segregation, mortgage fraud, separation from the river by a whole lot of heavy industrial followed by a massive highway. I mean, these were undoubtedly intentional decisions that were made and decisions that have ultimately impacted the community in a, in a negative way. And I think collectively we need to take responsibility for that and, and move towards fixing it. Um, and the, the pollution that has emanated from a combination of a whole lot of the heavy industrial along the river, whether it was is Northern Metals or, or GAF or a number of the other heavy industrial plants in that location um, do have uh, an impact on both uh, north Minneapolis, near north as well as across the river and northeast. You know, I can't tell you how many calls I get to my office on, on a very regular basis talking about the really noxious smell that, that we, we have um, on the, in the Botno neighborhood. And I do want to thank uh, Nancy Prismas as well as the Botno Neighborhood Association uh, for their work. Um, undoubtedly, I don't think we would be in this place today uh, where we have northern metals that is moving out, albeit not as quickly as we would like. Um, and uh, we do have firm objective statistics as to what the, the level of toxin is and the level of uh, particulate matter in the atmosphere without you. So seriously, thank you. Um, and, uh, and I do agree with the, I do agree with the speakers that um, we, we do need to make sure that the money from this settlement goes to the community that has been experiencing uh, the, the uptick in pollution. Um, I mean, you can literally, I mean, it's, it's no coincidence that when we, we go and we test that there are higher levels of toxins, whether it's lead or otherwise, in the blood of people who live in, in North Minneapolis and to a certain extent Northeast. Uh, and it's also not a coincidence that you can literally determine a person's likelihood of having a heart attack by the age of 50 just based on the zip code in which they were born. And that is especially truth in North Minneapolis and so I mean it's, it's a, these are sad realities and these are realities that we have to confront directly and not sort of beat around the bush on and so I'm I'm very proud and I'm pleased to see this moving forward right now um, uh, and I would like to see the um, that money allocated directly to the community that has been impacted for so long um, and uh, you know I do recall seeing a, a boundary that was drawn up um, as to where the location of, of the areas most impacted, it would include all of that area of the near north, just across the highway. It also in included a, a smaller section um, just across the river. And, and you know, I would I would like to, um, and I've I've read through your the, the resolution, uh, Council Members Cano and Gordon, and thank you, um, fully supportive. Um, there's a there's a minor di addition that I would like to make, if you would be so amenable, which is. Uh, so it's in that last paragraph. It says, be it, be it further resolved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, members from North and Northeast Minneapolis to plan for the use of the $600,000 earmarked for the community health projects that I would like to add in the impacted area surrounding Northern Metals. That's correct. It is already in this consent decree. I think that's fine. That's, yeah. that's fine with me. Um, and we haven't actually moved it yet, so that's I know, I'm good aware. to get some I just comments. wanted to yeah. just let you know ahead yeah. of time. Uh, and and again, uh, thank you to the to the community, the health department, um, and the MPCA, which will not <coughs> attend today for their work. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I did want to um, thank everybody for coming in and making their, those comments. I appreciate it a great deal. And I think within the, um, the consent decree, uh, it does seem like they give us quite a bit of latitude um, as I'm reading it. Um, it does say that they uh, shall solely be um, used, I should say, shall be used solely for mitigation projects in Northeast and North Minneapolis. So that's a pretty wide area, actually. But then it also says the mitigation projects shall include projects in the impacted neighborhoods, and it lists four items. 
Um, it doesn't say that it couldn't potentially also include additional, but it makes sure it include these. And some of them that I read, when I read it says identify and connect in affected individuals with resources to help reduce environmental exposure to lead. Well, some kind of study about where that lead poisoning is coming from or whatever could fit in there. So I'm not sure if the consent decree contradicts anything that we heard from the community in terms of what they um, would like to see happen. Um, or that it says, we, as long as it fits in those parameters, we can't run anything through a community process. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for here to have some kind of a win-win situation. And I don't know how to make sure that we get there the best that we can. I think that this resolution is a good start. And even though there's start to look at how um, how to spend these funds, and there is in the in the supporting material in the staff report, there's a um, Northern Metal Settlement Health Mitigation Strategies that are listed. The council's not approving these strategies today. We're approving accepting the money, and we're approving increasing the health department's budget so they can they can put the money somewhere. Um, and that's all we're approving, but all this other information is fantastic. Um, and I think we're acknowledging we have to live under the consent decree. Um, and we would anyway, even if we rejected the money. I mean, so... It, it, it's not that we're going to be able to reject the money, and I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if we didn't accept the money, I don't think it means that, that they would change their consent decree or anything at all. So that's settled, it's done, the judges ruled on it, and we're dealing with what we have. Um, and so now we want to deal with what we have in a way, I think, that works for the community um, and, and fits inside of the decree. Um, and I don't know if, um, Council Member Cano, do you want to move the... The resolution. Yes. Um, oh, and I think Councilmember Glynn, did you want to speak first? Yes. Okay. You go. Do you want. Oh, you get to You're speak me. first. Okay. I just All I right. didn't recognize it was your yeah. flag. <laughs> Thanks. I actually had uh, just like a question um, for staff in reading the consent decree. I didn't see in here, but I may not be reading it carefully enough. There's nothing in here that says when we have to spend the money. It it says you get two hundred thousand dollars each year. For three years or whatever I think but to, there is no direction in here as to when we spend the money to me that's a question that kind of goes to how much process could be involved um, in giving direction on how the money could be spent so I just have a question about that mr. chair uh, council vice president Glidden great uh, question and uh, um, I will touch base with our city attorney's office and see if their reading is the same. And um, I want to make sure that we uh, are open to whatever is not laid out in the, uh, and I think it's really important to say what's legally binding and what else is open for discussion. So thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Just a practical question there. Yep. So, um, and I don't think I have anything else that's for staff, but, um, so then just a couple more uh, points. One is just as Councilmember Gordon had said, and, and actually also as Mr. Huff said, I, in reading this, I really see that there is a lot of flexibility in uh, what are the options available. So that just says to me there's a lot of room for community direction um, in how much to spend where or what are the full range of projects and all sorts of different things. So. Um, I mean, I thought that's kind of what staff said as well, and maybe we need to kind of figure out kind of what's the process to continue to evaluate what can be allowed. Um, the third thing, though, that I heard from some of the community members here, and um, I, I honestly, I don't think that this is, at least in my opinion, any knock on our own staff, but just a question of kind of how much more oversight can there be from the council and ensuring that there is a uh, full and developed process and that uh, we're thinking very carefully through uh, this process. I think this kind of goes to the underlying issues of, of just trust and what is there to justify that trust from community to government. Again, I don't know that this is so particular to the city of Minneapolis or the health department per se, but just, you know, we're operating in a environment right now, a national and a state environment that really just does not engender trust. And, um, you know, we just had in the news recently about an organization whose uh, executive director uh, has been, uh, I 
think, just sentenced to four years in, in jail. Uh, and this was an organization that was there to implement uh, services to community, and including red, lead reduction and all these kinds of things, I think, really go to just what is the trust that community has uh, in the processes that are suggested by the bureaucracy, so to speak. So I just think that's an important thing to keep in mind. And I think it also goes to the question of kind of what's the time we need to kind of get it right and make sure we have a good process with a full range of, of community members. Um, these are the community members who were able to come today uh, to a public meeting in City Hall. And I'm sure there are others who are uh, highly engaged and involved as well. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. I don't know this, this resolution really doesn't go to kind of what's the feedback loop back to thinking through the process piece. And that may be something, maybe not here on the fly, but maybe something that we want to, uh, Councilmember Gordon, I'm just kind of looking to you mm -hmm. as the chair, want to think about is there additional language to add? And maybe mm -hmm. we could do that at the whole council meeting or, or some other time. Um, I just want to make sure that we have an opportunity to craft something that's uh, we we can get some feedback from staff and, and work on. So, all right, I'll just I make think that suggestion. I think that's a, a, a great idea, too. There really isn't a report back time on this or anything or um, feedback. I'll, I also, um, with some of the discussion here, how does this or does this not fit with the designation of the green zone, which isn't referred to in the resolution yeah. either? And maybe there's some potential here um, to, to, to ask staff or direct staff to coordinate those efforts or something, but maybe we also need to talk a little bit to the sustainability office and others about that between now and the council meeting. So okay. I'm not saying I've got an idea on the fly, but definitely it's something yeah. that reached out. We've also talked um, about um, participatory budgeting. What does that actually mean and how is that involved? We're going through, I think, a grant, a federal grant right now where they're trying to implement some of those strategies about how can you give some um, democratic discretion um, for some of the recast uh, funding. So there might be some some other tools or ideas we could try to implement, but I'm not, I don't have an amendment for this resolution right now. But Council Member Cano, you wanna move the resolution or talk about it a little? Yeah, sure, no, I just, I'd like to move the item forward. Thank you. All right. Um, and we probably don't have to uh, read the item, but we should, um, are you moving it forward? With the friendly amendment from Council Member Fry. Can you read that language again? Yeah, if I can find it in my I just papers. I want to make sure that language ends up being as broad as what is in the consent decree. So I actually am not sure I agree to that language. Um, it had to do with the final resolved clause, and I believe it said I'll read the whole clause and I'll put it in there um, and note where it comes up. Be it further resolved that. Minneapolis Health Department staff are directed to work with community members from North and Northeast Minneapolis to plan for the use of the $600,000 earmarked for community health projects in the impacted areas of Northern Metals, as well as any additional funding that comes to the city from the consent decree with Northern Metals. So I had it coming after health projects. It's a, the, the specific, and I'm open to alterations to it, but it's in the impacted areas surrounding Northern right. Metals. Can I speak to this? Yes, of course. Go ahead, Council Member. Okay. I just, I have a little concern about using language that may be different from what is in the consent decree, and then it has a different in, interpretation. So it's broad language, I will say. It's, you know, I just, I, I just, I have a hesitation about adding language that doesn't mirror what's in the consent decree, which already describes what are the areas that then could see the benefits um, from uh, any of the funding and any of the um, uh, mitigation efforts that the community will thus direct? I am fine with explicitly noting the consent decree within the amendment. So we okay. could say in the impacted, in the impacted area surrounding Northern Metals um, as delineated in the consent decree. But I'm, what I'm saying is that is different than what the consent decree says about mitigation. Um, so let me just pull up my document here. What the consent decree says on page 14, section F, is that Northern Metals has agreed to intervention in the city of Minneapolis in the, Ram, in the Ramsey County, oh, excuse me, uh, agrees it's going to provide 
uh, Ms. Minneapolis agrees that this money shall be used solely for mitigation projects in North and Northeast Minneapolis. So that is the language utilized in, in the consent decree. I think part of the reason for that, let me just be clear, is I don't know that we know for sure where the quote impacted areas because of the fact that there has not been the type of in-depth survey, causal, uh, causal report or evaluation that the community members have referred to. So I just, again, I think referring back to the consent language, we want to mirror the language in the consent decree because we do not know what are the, quote, impacted areas. So because that kind of research-driven work has not yet been done. So uh, I understand your Council, Mr. Council Chair, Member Council Member Glidden, I, I understand your point. Um, what I am hoping to do in this is is limit the area um, to areas, to, to, to neighborhoods that are actually impacted. And I'll give you one example. I arguably live in, North, in northeast Minneapolis. I live just off of East Hennepin Avenue. Um, this is not an impacted area. Um, I do not think that the money should be going to projects in the neighborhood where I live. Um, I think it should be going predominantly to others. And I realize that, that, that the, the consent decree is broad, um, but we do have the ability to further limit. So I have one more, one more point I wanted to make here. Um, so I just want to say that um, our staff, and it's actually up right now on the, on the overhead through kind of the input sessions they've already held, which were the two community meetings and then some selected interviews with some of the legislators, I guess, and some of the council members had developed these guiding principles, which include the last bullet, which says much, must benefit residents of North and Northeast Minneapolis close to the Northern Metal Shredder operations, which I think is kind of where you're trying to get at That's with correct. this. And this probably would be something good to review with any advisory committee once it's established, because I think they sound like very reasonable guiding principles. They're a little different though than saying what's in the consent decree which ends up saying what's kind of the breadth of what you might end up doing. And I just don't want us to shortcut what the community might end up recommending by, you know, now then we're going to have three different things of language. We have what's in this resolution. We have the consent decree, which is very broad. We have the guiding principles, which is not consent decree language, but for it seems to kind of narrow at least initially, and this is not something official, but it's kind of what the department has put together after doing the initial input sessions they described. So anyway, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we just do our best job, um, but I'm just saying, I don't know why we'd want to continue to limit our options before we even set up a committee to, to help guide us using uh, what is in the consent decree, which is fairly broad as kind of the absolute parameters. So maybe I could just note that the sentence that follows the one that you read, Councilmember Glidden also says the mitigation projects shall include projects in the impacted neighborhoods. Um, and I think this last um, resolve clause that mentions the $600,000 that's earmarked for community projects was talking about that. But whatever we call it, I don't know that it matters all that much. Mm -hmm. Whether, so I'm open to including something or saying impacted neighborhoods because it's in the consent decree or just leaving it out because it will still have to, those projects shall be implemented in there. So um, I don't know that that would be a solution to it. I don't think my previous language deviates at all from what the consent decree says. It, it, so it says the impacted neighborhoods. <laughs> so I don't understand that. Yep, seems pretty cons consistent, but yeah. I'm not sure. I think that I'm not even sure if we've moved it with your addition in there or if we, if we haven't. I think that I know I'm pretty clear that um, Councilmember Glidden prefers that we leave that language off. I did not move it with that language. All right. Do you think we should take a vote on yours as an amendment? Or can we just pass it like just it is pass now? It like All right. it is, I guess. And we're going to we're going to have a chance to work on it okay. before the uh, uh, council meeting too, so maybe we can okay. come up with some other suggestions and ideas. Um, uh, I know that Councilmember Bender also has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I you know, I, I do have a couple of questions and I just wanted to ask them just so I feel like people have a sense of what's happening after today's hearing and because um, I'm not sure I'm clear. Uh, so I think my questions are probably for staff. Um, 
first of all, I wondered if we have ever participated in something like this, if the city has ever been awarded this kind of funding through a, an agreement with a private entity or a lawsuit like this in the past that you can remember? Do you know? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, members, members of the committee, I'm not aware that this is kind of a unique thing. Um, I'm not aware of the city having been involved in anything like this in the past. We've been involved in consent decrees, which I'm sure you all know, but nothing nothing resembling this. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Okay. I think that's helpful because, I mean, so it seems then um, likely that we would have those kind of questions about what's the process going to be and sort of staff and community together are kind of inventing something new, which hopefully will help us move the dial on this issue. I guess I wanted to note one other thing, maybe echoing what Council Member Glidden said, was that, um, you know, we're in a unique position as the city because we are kind of the first level of government here, which hopefully is working with community to support and advocate for the same things, often to other levels of government, right? So the state government or private entities. Um, and and um, so I just think this process needs to um, hit the right level of, of detail here. So I, I wasn't sure. So there's four items. So this is, I guess, another specific question for the city attorney's office. Um, in the same section that Council Member Glidden was reading through, um, there were some specific, there were like four points of what the funding would be directed to in the consent decree. And I just wanted to check and make sure that, that we did feel that that was broad enough to, for example, entertain the idea of funding a study or kind of some of the other things that community members brought up today or that we're not constrained to those four specific bullet points in the consent decree. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I read it like Council Member Glidden reads that, which is I don't believe that those four specifically mentioned mitigation strategies um, are limiting. I do think, you know, the city needs to be careful and follow the consent decree, uh, but, uh, and you know, do what the consent decree was meant to do and meant to accomplish. Uh, but that's that's my reading of that language. And that's maybe because some of the language in there is about shall include and not limited to Correct. necessarily. Okay, thank you. I think that's helpful just to clarify. And then do we have a sense of when staff might sort of report back about the process? Or another question I had was how will the budgetary allocation be approved? Will it be an administrative decision by staff or would that decision likely come back through the council at some time? Well, I think if we don't um, ask for it, it's likely it could be uh, staff, something that the staff could decide. I do know that the consent decree requires the city to submit an annual report to the MPCA. Um, that, so at least there'll be an annual reporting that would go to them. And it, if it's um, coming from the city, the chances are it would go through the city council before it went to them. Um, uh, uh, does anybody else have any um, better understanding of, of how the money, I think once we allocated it to the department, Hmm. I guess that's a good question. Would you, would you um, have any preference? Any suggestions? We did talk about amending the uh, resolution to get a better report back mechanism and add some clarity to that um, issue. I think there's issues were raised about how are people selected on the stakeholder yeah. group and now how, are we fun how do we finally approve how the money's actually spent. I'm picking up that there's some interest in having some council committee oversight and involvement and council committee involvement in that. I don't have a staff direction for it right now, but we can work on that between now and uh, the council meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think that seems appropriate given the fact that this is kind of a newer process and the amount of of decisions that have to be made, but so I think that's a good idea to bring it through council. Both of those items? The funding. I think we probably need a report back on the process piece. Yeah. That committee. Sure. Council Member Clayton. Thank you. I was just going to add, I, I thought that's what kind of informally we had decided we would work on some language, kind of looking to you as a chair to maybe do that on both those pieces to come back, just because there's high interest in this. So one would be the process piece, and the other would then be the, the re other reporting back on the funding. 
And I'd be looking at all those people who were looking at me to do it to help me do it. Yes. So it sounds like Absolutely. it's a good deal. All right. So we have some work to do between now and the council meeting, even if we approve this resolution as written. Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is maybe a theme now with me, but I, I also just want to note that I still continue to have concerns about our staff capacity to do some of this additional work on top of all of the other things that we have staff working on. And, and that's not to say they shouldn't do it by any means, but um, I raised this issue when we were talking about green zones as well, um, because that is already a commitment that we've made to doing some significant community outreach about really important issues in the community. And I just want to note again, we haven't added any staff that I know of, maybe I'm missing something from last budget, but um, could, could we talk about it later after the meeting? Yeah. Okay. And this is just again a note to say that when we as policymakers are directing staff to do new significant pieces of work, I just want to make sure that we're either redirecting them to not do something else or adding staff capacity or just kind of understanding what that level of staffing that we need in the city to take on a lot of new tasks. So possibly uh, grant funding could help support this as well. There, there are certainly lots of answers to that question. I just want to make sure we're, we're, we're asking it as we're adding new work. So I just wanted to highlight before we vote on this, the uh, second resolved clause, because I think this is um, pretty significant and a lot of concerns have been raised about the uh, civil penalty. Earlier in the presentation, we saw where the money was going and there's a million dollar civil penalty. But somehow in the wisdom of the state legislature, that million dollars is absolutely locked into going into the, into the general fund. Um, we believe, I believe um, probably all of us on the committee, but at this point certainly the authors of the resolution um, believe that this should be reconsidered. And so this resolve clause is, is, is saying that the city council of the city of Minneapolis calls on the state to allocate the $1 million civil penalty not to the state general fund, but to projects that serve the residents of North and Northeast Minneapolis who have borne the brunt of the negative impacts associated with the presence of Northern metals near their communities. I think that makes sense. I think that would be a just thing to do. And that would also um, maybe bring more resources so we could even have a more robust process, but even more than that, um, have more robust um, solutions and mitigations in place. Um, so that's also part of the resolution. And I think we can, don't get overly hopeful that they're gonna listen to us, but nevertheless, making that statement would really help. And the more people and the more entities that can make those kinds of statements, the bigger difference that it can make in the end. I'm not seeing any more people who wanna talk about this. Council Member Fry, maybe. I, I only wanna add that I appreciate the work and that if, if, if it's okay, I would love to be added as, as a co-author as well. Oh yeah, Let's do that on request. Okay. Seeing no further comments, then all those, well, there's actually three things. Why don't we vote on the resolution and then we'll go back to the other two items. All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. And then on the staff report, we're also um, approving acceptance of the $600,000 and then a re uh, the resolution to allocate that to the health department budget on those items. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Those motions carry as well. And then I see no further business before us, so we are adjourned. Thank you. Okay. All right. And